I was trying to estimate how many times I've been on stage leading worship in my life last night, and I think it's actually close to 500 times. Um, I've been leading worship since I was 15, <clears throat> excuse me, and so I know what it's like to come on stage and sing compared to how many times I've preached, which is none times, <laughs> zero times. So this is new for me. Actually, when he asked me to lead a couple of weeks ago, he asked me to preach a couple of weeks ago, Brandon did. I was like, I, are you, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, me? And he said, yeah, why don't you think about it for a couple of days and get back to us? And I was like, why don't you think about it <laughs> for a couple of days and you can get back to me? That's a true story. And he did get back to me and he's like, still please do and stop being weird about it. So here we are. And I am really excited to share my story, kind of share some of the things that have been on my heart, and, um, and I guess preach, so here we go. Uh, we're going to start with our, um, well, actually, I don't know if I, I know Brick kind of introduced me, but maybe I should just start with telling you a little bit more about who I am. I, like, I'm, like he said, I'm a worship leader. I am a wife to my husband, James, who is also on... Uh, also on the worship team, I have a 13-year-old son who, you know, may have told you an inappropriate joke. If you know him accidentally, I'm sorry, around here somewhere. And a 10-year-old, uh, Asher, and I am a singer and a songwriter, and <clears throat> my job is that I'm actually a trauma-informed life coach for artists and creatives, especially in Hollywood and Nashville. So I get to work with the extra swirly kids. Um, as they navigate the things that are in the way of them pursuing some of the, the big dreams that they feel called to. So that is, that's who I am. So let's start with um, Romans 8, 1 through 4. Um, maybe you'll see it up there. We're going to, or you can get out your Bibles or your Bible apps or whatever. Okay, I'll read it to you guys. It says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. <clears throat> so, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Rome. Uh, Post-resurrection church in Rome, it was made up of Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. And he wrote this letter to them because they had very different ideas and views of what the church should actually be. Different values, different ways that they thought that they should express themselves in the community and with each other and all kinds of things. And so there was a lot of dissension, a lot of fighting, a lot of argument. And he wrote this letter because he wanted to give them kind of like a back to basics overview of the gospel. And I appreciate that sometimes. When Do you ever feel like when you're like, maybe in your head too much or you're arguing with somebody and you're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, let's just remember, what is this about? What are we about? What are we doing here? So that's what he wanted to do with the Book of Romans. And I will say, we have incredible people in this church that can help you dig through the exegetical, theoretical meanings of all of these things. And I am not that person. <laughs> I am not a theologian. And so this morning, I... I think because our church is so much, our church, your global church today is in so many ways so much like the church that Paul was speaking to, I, as a member of that church, just want to share my experience and my story. And, you know, speaking of an overview or back to basics, that's what I'll give you about myself and my history. So I was born and raised in church. I mean, from like send, nursery school to Sunday school to choir to youth group to becoming a worship leader in ministry in the Christian church my entire life. It was my worldview, it was my context, it was my family, it was everything to me. And it kind of floated along in this um, trajectory of becoming basically a career worship leader. And um, it wasn't until I was 31 years old that I found myself seemingly out of nowhere 
struggling with panic attacks. So I was um, a few months postpartum, and I was finding myself with so much anxiety that I actually ended up in the hospital for panic attacks. Um, it was a really, really painful times and time, and th those panic attacks would last for a few years, but I always feel like whenever I share my story, it's kind of like if you haven't experienced panic and anxiety, you don't know anyone who does, it's hard to like really understand, but if you have, if you are currently, I want you to know that it is so healable. That's what I really want to go into today too, as far as what we know from a trauma-informed perspective. It is so healable. If I can heal, literally anyone can heal. But back to that part of my life, so this is about 10 years ago now, for a few years I was really, really wrestling, and I was trying to use everything that I knew in my worldview, my Christian worldview, to try and figure out what was happening to me and how to get above it. I was trying to figure out through scripture and through um, worship and through trying to get counsel in the church of, of what's going on with me. How do I get rid of this? How do I heal myself? And uh, it made me a really good worship leader, actually, because I was constantly pushing back the darkness. And I, the darkness was coming from actually messages from my body that there was pain that needed to be dealt with. But I didn't know that. I only knew how it felt was that every, the world was kind of caving in. And, and I just wrestled so much that it actually was the thing that kind of put this idea in my head of, I need to go to ministry school. I need to learn about this more. And <clears throat> I went to ministry school for three years. I was a worship leader on very big stages, and I was drowning. I was absolutely drowning in anxiety and panic. And I think that what I wish that I would have known at the time was that turning in compassion towards myself would have gone a long way, and fighting against it was what was making it feel so, so, so big. Um, but what happened was something that happens with a lot of people in our generation was that I began to question the faith context that I was living in. I, I know that deconstruction is kind of a word that is uh, not a fun word. It's certainly not a fun, like, um, if you're in the church, you see so many people that are kind of deconstructing their faith, and it can be confounding if you've never walked through it. And I will say that spiritual formation, spiritual development, you will actually walk through a deconstruction phase. That's actually a really normal part of, of spiritual formation. So there's nothing wrong with taking a step back and kind of questioning some of the things that you were taught and making your faith your own. And that's where I was at. I was really, really struggling, and I was technically deconstructing my faith, and I did have to take a step back. And my question at the time was, uh, why, why am I struggling when I've been in this context, but what makes a healthy human? Like, what is our experience of life supposed to be as healthy humans, especially as healthy humans who, as humans who are connected to God? You know, you, there's so many spiritual paths that kind of, as I know people, and I'm sure you do too, from all over the spectrum as far as faith and spirituality in this, this world that we live in today. So many spiritual paths that invite us to transcend our human experience. Jesus is the only spiritual path that invites us deeper into our human experience. He was a God that became human to show us that it is safe to be on this earth, in our human bodies, connected to God. And I just started to really question a lot of, of the disconnect between my spiritual self and my physical self, because there was a disconnect, and I wanted to figure out why. So I started to ask, what is a healthy human? So I want to share with you guys um, well, and I will say, too, that after going through so much of my own uh, recovery and healing anxiety and really, like, resolving trauma, there was, some, there was some hard things from my own childhood that I did need to look at. And I went on this journey with my own trauma therapist of really undoing shame and uh, revisiting some of those, you know, some of those painful memories. And a lot of it was just kind of establishing healthy, safe um, 
practices in my own daily practice. And it ended up kind of inviting me to want to work with people who were also struggling, which how, much you, how many of you guys know, when you go through something hard, you do kind of want to talk about it. You kind of want to help you, people who have gone through it also. And that's what I felt. I had sort of gone through so much, um, so much pain and so much suffering and so much confusion as a Christian struggling so much with panic that when I began to like get my feet underneath me and I began to realize how available healing actually is, um, I wanted to help other people. So I got my own certification in something called the Compassion Method, and it is a trauma-informed certification. So I now help people um, that are facing the same things as, as I do. Over the past few years, that's what I've been doing. So when I was asking the question, what makes a healthy human? Well, it first led me to understand what keeps us from being healthy humans. And what keeps us from being healthy humans. When I say healthy humans, I mean a human being that is able to be present, that's able to contribute to the community that they're in, that's able to connect to others, that naturally wants to create beautiful things, that's able to be with themselves and their emotions without getting sucked into it. A healthy human is somebody who is physically well and, uh, and, or can be compassionate with themselves when they aren't. Um, and there are actual measured things, overwhelming research around what keeps us from that experience. What keeps us from that is two things, trauma and shame. So I want to talk about what trauma is. Trauma is an emotional, uh, actually I'm going to read this one. Trauma is a lasting emotional response to a distressing single event or a series of events that can have negative and lasting impacts on a person's physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So from a trauma-informed perspective, a baby is born into the world wired for love, uh, safety, and connection. And we experience, because we live in an imperfect world, danger and disconnect disconnection. And that can come in, we call it capital, capital T trauma, which is like an, a major event that happens, loss, divorce, uh, natural disaster, abuse, there can be really big things that happen in our childhood that kind of overwhelm our ability to cope. Um, but a lot of the trauma that people are carrying are these uh, lowercase t traumas, these traumas that are little disconnections. Maybe there was bullying, maybe there was uh, parents that were kind of distracted in their own minds that weren't able to fully be present with you. Maybe the, there were um, experiences of you know, siblings that were fighting so much that left you feeling uh, afraid in your own home. There's so, many, like, there's so many things that can happen to, especially in your zero to 12 programming from a trauma-informed perspective, there's so many things that can create this experience of danger to your body that can just be a message of danger and hopefully Ideally, I should say, we have two parents that are able to be with us in those experiences, but often, a lot of us didn't. The other thing that can keep us from being a healthy human is shame. Shame is the perceived disconnection from love. So like I said, ideally we have two adults that are able to be with us in these experiences, but if not, what happens is the child brain, it's not able to say, gosh, my parents don't seem to be totally healthy and present and, and happy. Uh, or, gosh, there are things that, that are going on that seem to be my environment. Children's brains can't do that. They can't put together that there's something wrong with the people or the environment around them. The only way that they can cope with shame is they think there must be something wrong with me. And the problem with this is that if you grow up with a sense that there's something wrong with you, that you are disconnected from love and it's your fault, then there are a lot of things, so many things that we know that, can, that we can try and do to cope or to reconnect with love. That's what sin is. Sin is we're trying to like get back a sense of connection to something or to numb our sin is also what we do to numb ourselves from the feeling of disconnection from love. Gabor Mate uh, says it's, He's one of the fathers of trauma res uh, resolution science. He says, he defines trauma as not what happens to you, but what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. He says, we shouldn't ask why the addiction, but why the pain. Another way to say that is, it's not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. 
So when we think about what keeps us from being a healthy human, <clears throat> and we know that it's trauma and shame that keep us from expressing our truest, authentic, most loved selves, um, it can feel really overwhelming. It can, it can feel really hopeless because we can't go back and relive our, our childhood in physical form. But there is nothing but good news when it comes to healing this. N absolutely nothing. And I can tell you from taking a step back from church and just studying the science behind it um, that we have overwhelming evidence and I'm, I am known to be kind of like a ridiculous optimist, but I think it's a really exciting time to be alive. I know I just gave you guys a bunch of bummer news, but I, genuinely, we are having such a, uh, I, I believe like a emotional growth spurt as a human species. And it's such an exciting time to, to be here because we never had this research before that shows us that everything is actually healable. And so when we talk about what makes a healthy human, well, a healthy human was once a well-loved child. And that could also feel really discouraging, except that we have the ability, and trauma, science, trauma resolution science confirms this over and over and over again, that we have the opportunity to cultivate a sense of being a well-loved child, no matter how old we are. And you know who else does that is Jesus. Jesus was a well-loved child. Jesus was a healthy human, and he invites us into the same experience and the same connection to God that he, ha that he had. I want to talk about the attributes of a well-loved child. So according to attachment theory, which we'll talk about in a second, attachment theory and the cutting-edge research around child development, children with secure attachments meaning they grew up feeling so loved and protected and seen and heard and their needs were met by a mom and a dad. Children that grow up with secure attachment grow up feeling safe, valued, and able to explore the world. These attributes include confidence in their worth and lovability, ability to navigate relationships with trust and openness, resilience in the face of stress and setbacks, courage to explore new places, and a desire to contribute to, serve, and care for community. The most amazing thing about this is that well-loved children grow up to be healthy, secure adults that want to take good care of themselves, create beautiful things, and have a natural desire to serve those around them, right? That's, that's the conclusion of, of what it means to actually be on this earth so deeply loved. You actually express in a different way than somebody who's deeply wounded. And what I believe the most incredible thing about the life of Jesus is that he said, I feel so connected to God. I call him Abba Father. I call myself his son. And I am the first among many brothers and sisters. He invites us into that same connection that he has. He invites us to become well-loved children in the same way that he was. So I think the thing about taking a step back uh, from the church was that I realized um, <clears throat> in my studying was that everything that I was research researching and studying and experiencing myself was exactly everything, uh, the essence of the gospel that I grew up with. But it wasn't taught to me maybe in a way that was helpful for me when I met my own anxiety and trauma that needed to be healed. And I think that in this day and age, it is essential that we understand what's going on when people are leaving the church. Because at this point, I now, for the past five years, have worked with, with kids who, I mean kids, I'm 40, so I feel like I get to call them kids. 20s and 30s are kids to me. Those are the people that I work with, and they are leaving the church. And we know, just statistically, millions of people are, are leaving the church. But I know the ones that I work with, they don't want to. There are so, so, so many people that wish they could feel safe in these spaces, but they don't, and they don't know why. And, you know, there are, of course, a lot of people who find connection and belonging, connection to God, connection to other people. They're out outside of church, sure, but there are a lot of people who miss these places. There are a lot of people who miss this. 
And it made me wonder, are we places, are we safe places where people can be reminded of their belovedness, of, of how deeply loved they are, safe places for people to be in process? And like it says in Matthew 18.3, how Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He knows that well-loved children change things, do beautiful things, bring heaven to earth. That was the invitation. But I don't think that's the message that the world is always getting from here, from the church. Not here, but from the church. <laughs> I love you guys. Um, <laughs> truly, I think we are invited as a global church to be, to be these safe places. So, like I said, I think in so many ways, the church today parallels the church that Paul was talking to, and so he goes back to the basics, right, and he like explains this, the entire gospel. And so what I, I want to do is give you a little bit of basics of, around just the phrase, there is no condemnation. This is the, these are the basics. Do you know what condemnation is? Condemnation is, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as strong disapproval. Strong disapproval is actually a protective reaction that your body has to something dangerous. So it's kind of like in the family, of, in the emotional family of disgust. So if somebody was to like place like moldy cheese in front of you for dinner, and you were going to eat this, and you like didn't realize it was moldy, but then as you got it close to your face, you realized it, and you were like, ugh. Do you see what I did there? I was like, ugh. Your body is recognizing there's something dangerous trying to enter our system. We do not approve. And so we like, we push it away. That's actually a protective reaction. Thank goodness we have the emotional disgust because it does protect us from eating things, from taking things in that are, that are harmful to us. Disapproval is similar in that we are, re we act, it's actually a reaction out of fear. And I think that that's fair. I think that there are a lot of things that we see out in the world that are genuinely frightening to see. There are people that are, we love that are lost. There's so many people that are so, uh, they're, they're seeking and they're um, trying all sorts of different things and they are, feel so disconnected from love that they're trying to do whatever they can to feel a connection or to feel numb from the disconnection. And we in the church see that and we are getting so afraid for them, but it's coming out as disapproval. And the thing about those emotions is that uh, you, can f the, you can feel the emotions in other people's bodies. There's a lot of science behind that as well. But have you ever just been in the room with somebody who's highly, like, anxious or, like, really angry? And you're like, Ugh. Like, you can feel that. <laughs> there are so many people that just kind of get that sense from a lot, of, a lot of churches. It was interesting because when we were church, uh, looking for a church, we moved back here two years ago. We decided that we wanted to, to go to church and we wanted to belong to church. And we went to probably over like six months, like eight or nine different churches in Orange County. And they were all really lovely. They were really kind people at each church. But what was interesting was every single church that we went to, they talked about this epidemic, this problem of people leaving the church. And then they would always list the reasons why they think that was happening. And I could tell from the reasons they were listing that they had, themselves had never left the church. It is not easy to leave the place that you were raised in. It wasn't something that I just did because I was ugh, bored or because there were more fun things out in the world. That's not at all what it was. I didn't find a place that understood what was happening in the human body with compassion. And I, I think that the generation, especially the generation behind me, are finding more compassion on social media than they are from the churches. And I think that that can change. I really do. And that's why I want to be here. <clears throat> Condemnation, when we're looking at the world from the church's point of view and we're, we're noticing all of the... the things that are scaring us, all of the, the crazy things going on, and we notice that like, that disgust reaction or that like fear reaction, that disapproval reaction. The antidote is not approval. We're not, we're, we're not like supposed to say like, it's all fine. Like that's not true and it's not helpful and it's not what a good, it's not what good um, parents do to kids, right? We have, we know that there are things that we can do that are helpful and unhelpful. The antidote and it may not even be our job to, to say in every circumstance what we think is the exact right thing to do. Um, it probably isn't. But 
the antidote to, to disapproval and to condemnation is not approval. It's compassion. Compassion is what connects people. Compassion is what says, we don't ask why the addiction, we ask why the pain. Compassion is what doesn't ask what's the matter with you. It says, what happened to you? And I think that, you know, I always get this, being raised with this verse my whole life, right? Uh, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's just one of my memory verses. It's always been something I heard. And then I would always get it with the side of warning of like, but make sure you don't abuse that grace. Make sure you don't abuse that grace. And I remember as a kid even being like, yeah, oh, okay. You're like, yeah, it's, but it's good, but it's, be careful, okay. Like warning, a warning, a warning with it. And I understand it, but I'll say that what the science shows us is that uh, well-loved kids don't actually abuse their parents' love. So maybe we focus less on if other people are abusing the grace of God and more on do they feel like God does not disapprove of them. <laughs> because we know, and this is the, this is the thing that I, that I discovered, trauma science and the life of Jesus are saying the same thing. We have the opportunity to be well-loved kids at any age. And it starts with compassion towards ourselves and towards other people. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wanted to remind the church in Rome what we should remind ourselves here as well, that God does not disapprove of his children. He is the ultimate loving parent, and because of Christ, we have a forever connection to his love, able to offer the same grace to others that we ourselves have received. So when we were taking a break from church, um, probably a few years ago, I was invited to my friend's church because she was uh, dedicating her son. And so it's weird because I'm, I'm a church kid. I am a church kid. I mean, like, from my whole entire life. You guys get that point now. I, it was my whole context. And so leaving and then being invited into somebody else's church, it was just so awkward and, and strange. It was like my home, but not my home. And just felt like, Ugh. and uh, when I was there, they were singing um, this song called Lean Back, and it was like, I don't know if you've ever heard this song, but it's um, basically talking about the relationship between a child and a dad, uh, the father, God the father, and it says, I will lean back in the loving arms of a beautiful father. Um, I will breathe deep and know that he is good. He's a love like no other. And I'm just thinking about like everything that I was learning at that point and just putting together like, I didn't learn something different when I left the church. That like none of this is real or like this, this is fake or this is manipulative. I didn't learn that. What I did learn was I don't, think that the church knows always how to make sense of what's happening in the human body, and that's a big area of growth for us. I do believe that. But I also learned that Jesus and what we know about emotional health and trauma science are both inviting us into our belovedness, into our connection to God. And I'm putting this together in worship, and I'm just like, yeah, like this is this is everything. Like This, this is where I want to be, and this is where I want people to be. I want these, I want church to be these, these safe places. You know, we have so many people that left um, the church. When we were journeying through this, I'm, I'm sure you know too, there's, there are a lot of friends of ours that ended up deconstructing down to nothing, down to just going off on their own. And I'm not judging anybody's journey. I'm just saying we've, we do know people like that. And they've asked us, why did you go back? Because, because there's a lot of church hurt and church trauma there too, right? for a lot of people, and I, I could just say because what I think the church could be is so compelling. What I think we could be here, safe places, for people to, to, to come and to be loved and to be connected to, to be a part of a family, which is something they may have never experienced their entire lives, is so compelling. 
and I know I'm a worship leader, so I gotta plug worship, but worship, you guys, is one of the healthiest things you can do for your actual physical body. Like, when it, there's a list of things that you can do if you are struggling with depression, and singing and dancing are at the top. And so singing every week with people about love, to love, with people you love, receiving love. If there are other places that you're doing that outside of the church, like that's awesome. But I don't know of many, and I think the potential for what the church can be is so compelling to me, and it's why I'm here. And so I'm in the worship, and I'm you know, thinking about all of this stuff, and then they start singing this tag to the song. It's not even on like the original song. <clears throat> but they start singing this tag. Uh, I, th I thought I knew what love was. I thought I knew what love was. But it's better. It's better. It's better. I thought I knew what love was, but it's brighter. And I realized that in my own journey, it was the Holy Spirit that had led me through every single detour, every single place that I had ever been. And I think for so many of us, we have forgotten that, or maybe need a fresh reminder that the good news is better than good. <laughs> you think you get to a point where you feel this fresh revelation of how good God is? There's more. There is so much more. So I want to end in prayer. And for anybody that feels like they're struggling or you know somebody that's struggling, really struggling with anxiety, it can get very, very dark. And I just want you to know Healing is so possible. It really, really is. I see it happen all the time, and I've experienced it for myself. And I've experienced my family healing. I've experienced my, my nervous system healing, my body. I just really want you to know, no matter how dark or scary you may have felt, healing is, is so possible. And then, you know, as you are thinking about this generation of people outside of, of the church that sees no use for it, instead of getting in fear, instead of noticing that, that concern that you have and ruminating over it, I would have you ask, how can I turn this disapproval? How can God help me turn this disapproval into compassion? If he can turn graves into gardens, he can certainly do that. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for the reminder that you are such a loving parent offering to us the experience of being a well-loved child just like Jesus was. Lord, if there's any disapproval that we've that we've Carry that we haven't exchanged for compassion and wisdom. We offer that to you now. And we thank you, God, for how you are always offering healing to each of us and connection to each of us through Christ. We thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.